First of all, I want to welcome you. My name is Bill Meyer. I'm the executive director of uh, Warnham Tramming. And um, we have begun a monthly forum. This is the, the first one of this series. Um, I'm a cultural activist. Many of you know me, and a uh, musician and uh, founder of this group. Uh, Warnham Tramming is a, a project oriented community organization supporting Hamtramck residents uh, from discrimination, racism, xenophobia, through culture and through uh, the arts. We have sponsored many events. We've been around 10 years with various projects that include the Home Suite, which is a musical uh, multimedia project which talked about immigrants in Hamtramck and uh, we performed it live and it's on DVD now. It's available on our website. Uh, we also sponsored and produced the Arab Mural, which is across the street, down one block, on the wall of the Sheba restaurant, one of the most beautiful murals in the state, for sure. The only outdoor Arab mural, <coughs> glorifying and representing the Arab uh, Yemeni Muslim community. Um, um, we've had many public forums and concerts and film series, and now we're working on our newest project, is a dual project. We're sponsoring a, another mural project like this one in the Bangladesh community over on Conant. It's going to be a large mural outside and it's going to be uh, revealed in conjunction with a live recreation of the 1972 concert for Bangladesh, which was by George Harrison and uh, uh, Ravi Shankar back in 1972. And we're going to recreate that to some degree. And it's going to be on Conant probably near the end of the summer. We're working on that, so if you want more information or you want to help us with that, be sure and uh, let us know. Uh, we have uh, a board of directors and we also do not have a membership list, but if you want to be on our mailing list and be active with us, please make sure you put your name and phone number and email address on the, on the sign in sheet when you came in. Uh, we thank you for being here today. Uh, our next monthly forum will be on March 25th. It's going to, the subject matter is going to be about Bangladesh. It's going to be in the Bangladesh community. Uh, but today, we host a very important discussion, which is very needed. This is about Muslims in America, especially Yemenis, and how they're affected not only by the war in their own country, but how uh, uh, Yemeni Americans are dealing with it and have to live here in this country that's doing stuff to their country. Uh, we have two great speakers today. I want to thank uh, a few people before we go on. Uh, first of all, the committee who helped us uh, get this organized very hastily. This is very quickly organized. Uh, I want to thank Mike and uh, Mike Duffy and uh, Steve uh, and, and Twyla and um, uh, JVP especially, Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, who you'll hear more about later. They helped us bring our guest speaker today, ben, uh, uh, Phyllis Pence. And uh, we want to thank uh, uh, Sharon Feldman and uh, um, Ramsey Hussein, who could not be here today, but he helped us organize this. And I hope I didn't, and didn't forget that or you meet the rest of the people, uh, especially this person who uh, I went to first to try to help put this thing together and she, without hesitation, volunteered and was excited about doing it. Just like she was when we did the Arab Miro project. She was in the front of it, she was the core, and she's an outstanding community activist and a positive person, just brings life and joy to every project we do. Um, I'm going to introduce her now and then she's going to say something and she'll explain what the program is going to be this afternoon. This is Hanan Yahya. Lessons be upon you. I am Hanan Yahya. I am um, Yemeni American. I grew up in Southwest Detroit, um, and I was introduced to One Ham Tramic through the Arab Mural Project, as he as he has mentioned, um, uh, three years ago. And ever since then, I've been really passionate about doing work in Ham Tramic. Um, and uh, like Southwest Detroit, Ham Tramic faces very similar. Um, obstacles of you know inclusion and um, and dialogue and things like that and I really really appreciate my time working with them uh, I really appreciate Bill Twyla the team um, and I really appreciate um, just the, the welcoming nature of Hamtramck uh, I've always had a blast doing work here um, without further ado uh, I will explain briefly what the agenda is going to look like uh, so we're going to have uh, each speaker dedicate 30 minutes to speaking on um, the issue of the Yemen war and the Muslim ban and how it impacts the community. And then we will have um, a question and answer session that will be moderated by Bill and I, um, and we'll open it for dialogue. So 
we appreciate you coming. Um, and I think we're gonna introduce our first speaker. Thank you so much. Should we have to introduce our second speaker? Uh, I'm sorry, I was talking to somebody, I didn't hear the program, but yeah, we are gonna have Phyllis Bennett first and then Fatina, and then we're gonna have a dialogue together for uh, uh, 15, 20 minutes, let them ask each other questions, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience and let you all be part of the discussion. So uh, to introduce our first guest, uh, we want, to, want you to meet a gentleman who's working very hard on her tour this weekend here in Detroit, and he's very active with Jewish Voice for Peace Detroit chapter, uh, Don Greenspan, Don Greenspan. Detroit Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, Dave Finkel back there is the other co-chair. It's a national organization. It's dedicated to a just solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict, but it also is dedicated to much more. It fights anti-Jewish bigotry, anti-Muslim bigotry, and all other oppression. Um, it's dedicated to peace and justice in the entire Middle East. And on the board of, Detroit, of Jewish Voice for Peace is Phyllis Bennis. And she's here today from Washington. She's no better representative of the mission of, Jew, of Jewish Voice for Peace, of a just and, and, and uh, 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 a peaceful solution to the Middle, East, uh, the Middle East situation in all of its aspects. Uh, Phyllis is the director of the new international project at the Institute for Policy Studies, which is a progressive think tank in Washington, D.C. And she's a writer, a political activist, a commentator. You may have seen her um, uh, on many, many television, uh, radio shows. She's, by, she's, on, she's been on CNN, P PBS, NPR, MSNBC, um, we've seen her a lot, Lawrence O'Donnell at 10 o'clock. I, I think it's very unusual to have somebody so progressive to actually make it into the corporate media, and she really, for some reason, has, has done that, and it's, it's, it's really been helpful to get a progressive point of view. And her specialty is on the Middle East. She's traveled in the Middle East. She's authored approximately 11 books. And if you haven't read any of them, I really invite you to do so. Any, uh, any conflict in the Middle East, she's got a book on Iran, she's got one on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and they're called uh, primers. And what they are is they, 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 they take the conflict and they break it down and they explain it in, in layman's terms so anybody can really really understand it, and they're just wonderful books. Um, I have read the book, uh, the book on Israel-Palestine, which is here today, and Phyllis has got an update to that, and I would really recommend that as well. The other book that she has is a new book called Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror. And I haven't read it yet, but I'm interested in reading it. Last night, my wife got up at 2 o'clock in the morning, um, came back to bed, and she says, guess what? I started reading Phyllis's book. It's absolutely wonderful. And I said, well, you couldn't have waited until the morning to tell me that. But she, was, she was actually so excited about reading this book. So I'm really interested in reading it, and I hope everybody else is. So we have these books today. This one is understanding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's absolutely wonderful. It's like question and answers. So anytime you have a, a question that people will ask, it's answered here. The other book that is on sale today, my wife Sharon is, such, Sharon is such a good salesperson, I hope there's more books uh, available by the end of this program, is the Understanding ISIS book, which is uh, really, really an important topic. And the third book that David back there is selling is called Baleen and the Nonviolent uh, non Resistance.
by Iyad and Bernat. Um, we were in Belin. It's the center of nonviolent resistance in the West Bank of Palestine. He's a wonderful, wonderful individual, and uh, they're doing great things trying to uh, get rid of the apartheid law, uh, law in Israel. So I would recommend all of these books. The other thing I'd like to say is uh, Phyllis is going to be here um, the entire weekend, and this uh, talk is, is, is on uh, the situation, the tragic situ situation in Yemen and the Muslim ban. So, thank you all for coming this afternoon on this extraordinary, way too warm, scary, wrong, but gorgeous day until today, and now we get snow. So, at least that. It was 77 yesterday in Washington. Really? It was 70 here? That's just wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. No, there's no global warming. <laughs> it's all a plot. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you, Don, for the intro. Thank you, Bill and Hanan. Thank you, one Ham Hamtramck. Is that right pronunciation? And I just have to say, I really do want to thank the city of Hamtramck for this mural. This mural is extraordinary, not only because it's really lovely, but it tells the truth about history, which you don't usually see in public murals that are here to brag about a city, right? It shows the, ex the expulsion of Native Americans. It counts how many white people and how many people of color lived here at various periods. It's kind of amazing. So thank you for, for that, too. I was going to talk today um, a little bit about Yemen, about the war in Yemen. But to talk about Yemen is a, well, there you go, is a little bit difficult because we don't, in the mainstream press, hear very much about Yemen. Yemen is the poorest country in the Arab world, has been for a very long time. There are, thank you, thank you. There are many Yemeni Americans and Yemenis living in this country who we don't hear about very often except when we hear about what happens to Yemenis who might want to come here and maybe can't when they are not allowed to because of new changing policy questions. But we're hearing a little bit about Yemen now because of Iran. We hear a lot about Iran. Unfortunately, a lot of what we hear about Yemen is based on a link to Iran that is really not accurate, is treated as something that it's not. But to talk about Yemen and the war in Yemen and the humanitarian crisis, the absolute crisis facing the people of Yemen, I wanted to start with a few steps back and talk a little bit about Iran. Not in some major way, but just some sort of background things that have been happening in the last period. Now you all know, a couple of you who may not remember, but most of the people in this room are old enough that you remember a few years ago, there was a lot of threat uh, that we were not only not going to have an, a nuclear agreement with Iran, but that there really could be a war with Iran. There was a great deal of tension. It was getting worse and not better. The, the deal, the nuclear deal that was being negotiated between the US and five other countries on one side and Iran on the other side was in great jeopardy. It was very unclear whether it would be signed or not. And if it was signed, would it be protected? Would Congress overturn it somehow? Would the Israeli government, who was trying everything to undermine it, would they succeed? These were all very serious questions. And they were serious, not least because we knew if that deal did not hold, the threat of a war, whether between the US and Iran, between Israel and Iran, where the US would then enter on the side of Israel, any of these things were possible. And it was important to remember that it was people calling members of Congress, calling the White House, holding up members of Congress to say, you cannot undermine this agreement. We need this agreement, this is a good agreement, and we want to be part of diplomacy, not war. And we won. It was one of the great legacies of the Obama foreign policy, was the deal in Iran. Not only is that deal in jeopardy now, we hear from 
the president over and over again, this is a terrible deal, we're going to tear up this deal. Well, maybe we're not going to tear it up, but we're going to change it. Really? You're going to change it? How are you going to do that exactly? This isn't a deal between the U.S. and Iran. This is a deal between the U.S., Britain, France, Russia, China, and Germany, and Iran. And all of those other countries are very clear, they're not going anywhere. They're not changing this deal. Iran has been very clear. They're implementing the deal. They're doing what they are obligated to do. And they have no intention of renegotiating it, reopening it. So the choice for the US is either we walk away or we stay. It's not an option to renegotiate new terms that we'll like better. Because the whole point of this deal is it's a global deal. It's an international deal. So that's what makes it very, very important. Despite all of that, right now, we are hearing new threats. We're hearing that Iran is on notice, that it's officially on notice, that nothing is off the table. We hear from the president and from the president's advisors. We see in the headlines, because the mainstream press is picking up this anti-Iran stuff like nobody's business. So we hear, uh, we, we're hearing headlines like one recently, the US might have to consider firing on Iranian boats. Really? Might have to consider, why? Why? Because in the context of the civil war in Yemen, I'll get back to Yemen, remember this is all about Yemen, this is all leading up to Yemen. In the context of the civil war in Yemen, there was an attack on a Saudi ship by one of the two sides in the Yemeni civil war. Now you might ask, what's that got to do with us? And what's that got to do with Iran? And the answer to both is, not a whole hell of a lot, but something. So on the side of the U.S. having something to do with it, the U.S. is part of the Yemeni war. Now this isn't a war like the Iraq war or the Afghanistan war. The war in Yemen is essentially a civil war. It involves two sides that have been fighting against each other for a pretty long time. It was a group of rebels against the government that has gone through a lot of shifts, a lot of twists and turns. The government was overthrown by a popular uprising in 2011 at the time of, remember the Arab Spring? Remember how optimistic we all felt at the time? Yemen was one of the success stories of the Arab Spring, forced out a very dictatorial ruler who was then replaced by somebody who was recognized globally by the UN, by the US, by others in the international community, but turned out to be a pretty terrible ruler in a whole bunch of different ways. And a group of rebels known as the Houthis, the Houthi rebels, who have been around in, in Yemen for a long time. They're an indigenous group within Yemeni society. They took up arms against this new government who was being backed by Saudi Arabia. And they managed to drive out the new guy. He went into exile in Saudi Arabia who were supporting him. And in the meantime, Iran, who had had in the past some small ties with this rebel group, Iran sent messages to the rebel group, to the Houthis, which were intercepted by the CIA. And though the intercept has, has uh, detailed what they said, but the essence of it was they urged the Houthis not to go to war, not to take up arms against Saudi Arabia because too many civilians were going to be hurt. Unfortunately, the Houthis didn't listen to that, and they did. Uh, they did fight back. They, they started fighting against the Saudi-backed government. And in response to that, Saudi Arabia, which has been looking for how to expand its role in the region, how to become, if you will, the regional hegemon, the regional power, Saudi Arabia launched in March of 2015, almost two years ago, a vicious, brutal bombing campaign against Yemen. Vicious and brutal not only because every war is vicious and brutal, but because the impact was almost entirely felt by civilians. They are fighting against a guerrilla force that's not particularly big, has some control in some cities, but is not a standing military where you can bomb them and kill soldiers or something like this. More than 10,000 Yemenis have been killed in that bombing, in that set of bombing raids. So that's the role of Iran here. Iran is seen as being the supporter, the backer of the Houthi rebels. The problem is they're not giving them very much. They're giving some arms, they're giving some money. That only started after the 
Saudi uh, um, bombing campaign began two years ago. In the meantime, what's the U.S. role in all this? Well, the U.S. role is in two parts. The big thing is selling arms to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia is by far the biggest arms purchaser in the world of U.S. arms. Now, you all know about the arms that go to Israel. The difference there is it's our tax money that gives the arms to Israel. We pay for them. And it goes right from our tax money to U.S. corporations that manufacture the weapons. 25% goes to the Israeli manufacturers, 75% to the U.S. manufacturers. Israel gets the weapons, we pay the price. With Saudi Arabia, it's a little bit different. They pay their own way, as well they should. I mean, one might wonder about Israel. Israel is the 23rd or 26th, depending on whether you believe the IMF or the CIA, it's one or the other, wealthiest country in the world. So why are we giving them any money is a reasonable question to ask. But Saudi Arabia, that's not an issue. Saudi Arabia pays its own way. They buy their own weapons from us. And the US is only too delighted to give Saudi Arabia all the weapons they want. And if they're using them against Yem innocent Yemenis, no, oh, it's the cost of war, it's collateral damage, it's too bad. It's kind of too bad. Now, under Obama, the Obama administration did try to rein in the Saudis a little bit. Not very much. At, what, at one point, they refused to sell any more cluster bombs. Well, that's fine, except that now they have a huge stock of cluster bombs that they bought before, so they don't really need any additional ones. They urged the Saudis at various points to not target areas like the major port that Yemen depends on to bring in food. Yemen is 80% is um, needs 80% of its food to be imported. It's not growing anything. It's not, a, it's not conducive to very much agriculture. So the US is involved. It is our war. We're involved in one other way, besides selling the bombers, the planes, the drones, the bullets, the bombs, etc., to Saudi Arabia. The US military is directly involved. U.S. pilots from the Navy and the Air Force are flying U.S. Air Force special tanker planes to do the in-air refueling of the Yemen, of the Saudi uh, the Saudi bombers, so they can bomb longer. They can drop more bombs on Yemen. So what we have in Yemen right now is the combination of it being the poorest country in the Arab world for many many decades, and facing near famine conditions now because food is simply not getting in. 80% of the population of Yemen is dependent on US, uh, UN, sorry, UN, United Nations, food aid for survival. Just under 50% are what the UN calls severely food uh, challenged, meaning they don't know where food the next day will arrive. Severe food insecurity means you don't know where you will get food for your children 24 hours later. That's almost 50% of the population of Yemen. The war against Yemen is making all of that worse. In its latest report last week, the UN Humanitarian Agency, OCHO, uh, which is tracking famines that are emerging in parts of uh, Nigeria, where Boko Haram has, has been preventing people from getting access to food, in uh, a number of other countries, South Sudan, where famine is on the rise, and Yemen, and they said the worst global financial, uh, uh, sorry, famine crisis right now is in Yemen. And we are hearing virtually nothing about it. The New York Times and the Washington Post, both in the last couple of days, uh, did report on the UN uh, documentation on this new report from OCHA. That's a good thing. Maybe it's starting to get a little bit of attention. But it's a huge problem because the tensions with the US right now, with Iran, mean that there is a lot of interest in the White House among the president, the advisors, some of these people who want to go to war everywhere because it's all about America first, meaning America only, meaning we don't care about people in any other countries. Okay. That's what that means. That means that the threat of a new war with Iran is very real. Now, I am not, at the moment, 
alarmed about the prospect of a direct U.S. war against Iran. I don't think that's what we face right now. That could change, but right now I don't think that's a likely result. I'm very much afraid that what is a much more likely result will be a major escalation in the U.S. direct involvement in the war in Yemen, and it will be billed as telling Iran they can't get away with this. That will be the excuse. We won't go to war against Iran, where the price would be very, very high. We'll continue to go to war against the people of Yemen, backing the, the Saudi coalition, such as it is, and say that we're doing it to hold back Iran. Because a lot of this has everything to do with the regional challenge, the regional competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia. They're both big, powerful, wealthy countries with a lot of oil. They have different needs and different whatever, but they are competing with each other for who's going to be the major dominant power in the region. They are also, and this is secondary, but it's there, they represent the sectarian battle for influence between Sunni and Shia Islam. Which brand of Islam is going to be the dominant brand of Islam across the Middle East? Is it going to be Shia Islam as practiced in Iran and where there are Shia majorities in a number of other countries, including Iraq? Or is it going to be Sunni Islam, particularly the Wahhabi version of Sunni Islam as practiced in Saudi Arabia, that becomes the dominant form of Islam. So you have a sectarian battle that is on top of the old-fashioned power battle, if you will, that has to do with oil, has to do with money, has to do with arms, has to do with territory, has to do with all those things. So that's what we're, work, we're, we're looking at right now. And I think there is a serious danger of that kind of proxy war where the threat of a war with Iran is going to be played out in Yemen with even worse humanitarian consequences than we've seen already. So that kind of full-scale war is a very real danger. We're already seeing, now, many of you I think saw, when was it, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, the results of that failed uh, U.S. attack in Yemen against <coughs> AQAP, the Al-Qaeda uh, branch in Yemen, right? Which the Trump administration claims was a huge success. Yeah. A huge success where at least 17 civilians were killed, 10 of them children and women. One of them, an American citizen, an eight-year-old girl, was among the dead. We're not hearing about this. We're hearing that we got, we got 14 guys that we think are bad guys. Really, you think they are. And they admit that this raid was carried out not to even get those bad guys, if they were indeed, quote, bad guys, but to get some computer hard drives that had information on it that might be useful for the US. That's the, that's the legitimizing claim that's being made about this failed operation. But keep in mind, that operation has nothing to do with the war that Saudi Arabia is waging against Yemen. It's a completely separate thing. And again, Yemenis pay the price. Yemenis pay the price. We should also note that nothing that the US is doing in Yemen has been authorized by Congress. There is not even a, a, a foolish congressperson making the claim that we know isn't true, that the old authorization for the use of military force that was signed back in 2001 still applies in Yemen now. The way they claim that for Syria, they claim it for uh, Iraq, they claim it across the board that this very specific authorization that talked about authorizing the use of force against those who carried out the attacks of September 11 and those who harbor them, which whatever we think about that authorization, I don't happen to think it was legal, but be that as it may, it was talking about the Taliban in Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda, period, full stop. ISIS, as we know, did not even exist at that time, and ISIS these days is at war with Al-Qaeda. The notion that that somehow justifies going to war in Yemen against another branch of an organization that didn't even exist at the time, completely illegal. And unfortunately, no one in Congress, including our friends, 
including my friend John Conyers. Are any of you in JC's district? Yeah. Somebody should get on the phone to him and remind him of this. Remind him. He knows this stuff. He just needs to be reminded of it. We are talking about, there's one member of Congress, uh, Ted Lieu from California, has been very strong on this issue. But even Ted Lieu is only demanding a, an investigation of, of how the authorization might go. Nobody is actually talking about the fact that there is no authorization for this new war. Lou wants a briefing, not a new authorization. So there's enormous danger because right now we're looking at a, uh, a National Security Council where one of the leading actors, whether he's the official chair or not, is Steve Bannon, an, an overt white supremacist, racist, Islamophobic, xenophobic excuse for a diplomat who has no business being anywhere near the White House, let alone on the National Security Council. But with him playing a major role on the council, these threats of <coughs> horrific wars with no one in Washington paying attention to the human consequences become even more severe. The, the challenge becomes even more severe. So what we're hearing now, we hear from Donald Trump that Iran is taking too much in Iraq. <clears throat> and then he talks about how we should have taken Iraq's oil and maybe we'll have another chance. Maybe he's talking about another chance in Iraq. Maybe he's talking about another chance in Iran. You know, being this overt is kind of unheard of. Now, we all know that if the major product and major export of Iraq was broccoli, the U.S. never would have gone to war in the first place. That doesn't mean it was only about oil. But clearly, oil was one of the major features that made it an, an attractive war, if you will, for those people who wanted to go to war. So we hear again from Trump, I'm keeping my promises. Well, his promise was to tear up an agreement and virtually threatened to go to war against Iran. That's not a promise we want him to keep, thank you very much. It was bad enough that he was trying to legitimize that language in his campaign. We also should keep in mind that the Trump empire has a great deal invested in Saudi Arabia. It does not have anything invested in Yemen. Now, do I have evidence that that's the reason and we should note this is true of all seven countries that were identified for special punishment for its nationals. Not one of them has any investment by the Trump empire. Countries that do have investment were not among those targeted, such as Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Egypt, and others. If you look at just those three, if you believed, and I do not, if you believe that punishing the nationals of a country because other nationals of that country happen to have been involved in an early terrorist activity is somehow going to prevent terrorism, I don't believe that. But if you believe that, you might want to look at different countries than the seven, because none of them were involved, for example, in 9-11. There were no nationals of any of those seven countries. The 9-11 hijackers came from Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Egypt, who are not included. They do also happen to have lots of investment from the Trump empire. Do I have evidence that that's the reason they were chosen? No, I do not. I do not claim to have any evidence. But I do think that coincidences don't happen very often, and they don't happen three in a row very often. So I think somebody should look at that and see what we think might happen. Now, finally, I just want to say one other um, one other thing, I, I talked about how brutal the war is. We're seeing right now, in the last two or three days, and it may continue in the next several days, the possibility of a major escalation in the port of, I don't know if some of my Yemeni friends here can help me with the pronunciation, Hodeida? Hodeida. Hodeida. The largest port in Yemen, and where virtually all of the imported food comes through. The port has been bombed badly. It still is usable, but it will not be for very long if the bombing is escalated. The Saudis are telling humanitarian organizations, the United Nations and others, that they should send all the food to the port of Sana'a, the capital, the official capital. The problem is that's the other side of the country from the vast need near the main port. So this is a recipe for essentially genocide. The knowing result, knowing result, will be 
far more people, particularly women and children, who will be the most vulnerable, dying of famine. That is what we, uh, that is what we face. President Obama tried to convince the Saudis not to bomb that port. The Trump administration, when they issued their first statement on Yemen, left out a crucial two points. One, they did not call for not bombing that port. And number two, they did not call for a ceasefire in Yemen. It was seen widely in the region, particularly in Saudi Arabia, as a green light to go forward. And I think that is what we are facing today. We have a horrific war that's underway, people dying in enormous numbers, and an administration that is threatening to go to war everywhere in the world, as far as we can tell, but very specifically to go to war in the interest of our great friends in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia just happens to be bombing Yemen. So we have a lot of work to do. You know, we were, many of us were planning what was it going to look like our first anti-war demonstration on day one of a Clinton administration. We were not looking forward to an anti-war presidency. That didn't seem to exist. But this is a whole different ballgame. And it's taking a lot of energy and we have a lot of work to figure out new strategies, new approaches, new way to reach more people. And the way we do it is the way we've always done it one-on-one -on -one conversations, we talk, we visit communities who are the most affected. You here in Hamtramck have the great advantage that most of us don't have of having a large Yemeni community that's part of your community. And that's a huge gift. It's a huge gift. I wish we had that in Washington. It would make a lot of our work much easier. But you have it here. Take advantage of it. Work with that community. Be part of that community. I'm going to stop and we're going to have more conversation and then Hanan I think is going to introduce our next speaker and then I will come back later. Thank you. I want to first apologize because uh, on the flyer we have Latifa Ali who's supposed to be our guest journalist today but she flew in from New York last night and I'm guessing caught the flu or something so she's, she's very sick and couldn't make it. Um, so I really want to appreciate um, uh, uh, Fatina Abdurabo for, for coming uh, on such late notice. Um, and she's, she's um, amazing in her own level, and you'll know why. Attorney Fatina Abdurabo is the director of the American, Arab, uh, the American Muslim and Minority Advocacy League. Praised as one of the Arab American community's rising public intellectuals, Attorney Abdurabo is a graduate of Harvard University, the University of Pennsylvania, and the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. As civil rights director defending the rights of minorities in Michigan, her work has primarily focused on identifying unique challenges facing minority communities and reconciling their needs with the fundamental values enshrined in the United States Constitution. Attorney Fatina has work, uh, is, her work has appeared in leading periodicals, including the New York Times, Christian Science Monitor, the Detroit Free Press, and the Washington Times. Her work has also been published in premier academic journals, including the Harvard Journal of African American Public Policy, the Harvard Africa Policy Journal, the International Journal of Middle East Studies, the Journal of Healthcare for the Poor and Underserved, as well as many others. She has also appeared on national and international television as a part of her commitment to public service and advocating on behalf of Muslim Americans and minorities and underserved populations. As a part of her commitment, she has been invited to lecture across the country with national initiatives created to combat divisiveness, defend against bigotry, and foster understanding between Muslim Americans, minorities, and other groups. On an international level, Ms. Abdurabu has also represented the community in her travels to Niger, Liberia, and Egypt to the United States Department of State as a guest speaker on topics ranging from minority communities, empowering women, and gender-related advocacy. At Attorney Abdurabu is most proud of her commitment to defending the rights of oppressed people from all walks of life. Uh, please help me welcome Attorney Fatina Abdurabu. Hi, my name is Fatina Abdurabu. Thanks for that introduction, Hanan. Um, I have to say, full circle and how special it is to have people like Hanan introduce me ever or at any, any point. Um, she kind of slipped up initially in introducing me as a director of my previous job, uh, which was a director of a civil rights advocacy group called the EDC. And Hanan um, 
from our first day of operation there, was one of those people that rolled up her sleeves and helped out tremendously. And now for to have her equal level of support in our new role um, uh, with an organization called the American Muslim and Minority Advocacy League that does similar work and civil rights work um, and aligning with minorities is so cool. So full circle, people like Hanan and the Yemeni community and folks sitting back there are really the ones that I say are the foot soldiers and we talk about fighting Islamophobia or standing up and resisting racism um, or bigotry. These are the people that are doing it and that are really gonna be the ultimate weaponry against that in this country. Full circle also, Dave, I can see Dave uh, and Phyllis who, I always hear people that are older complain about how they've aged. You two look the same and it's been like 20 years. I don't know, I was a student the last time I saw you guys, but you look awesome and to be with the heavy hitter like Phyllis is kind of cool, but I am sloppy seconds because Latifah was who you were expecting. So um, I'll try and say something of value to fill in as a panelist. Um, so while Phyllis talked about foreign policy issues, and she's the historian and the guru and person that focuses on that part, that part of the world, for so many of us Muslim Americans since 9-11, what we've really been working diligently do is almost, almost the opposite, to somehow say, in terms of at least in the area of racism and, and getting towards understanding Muslims or um, Arab Americans and Middle Easterners, and I'm conflating the three for purposes of you get what I mean, um, we really tried to work towards, we are second and third generation, several of us. So my great-grandparents came to Ellis Island, and my story is not, um, I think, terribly unique. Um, we, if you look at the statistics, for instance, for Muslims in the state of Michigan, you almost have a 20% chance of your physician being a Muslim. That's pretty high. Um, and it's kind of going back to the basics, but that means, you know, in effect, that the person you're entrusting most with your, you know, healthcare is likely named Muhammad or Hassan or has a beard or has a scarf. So these are people adhering to the Islamic faith, identifying as being Muslims. Now the stats on Muslims, of course, are across the board from five to 10 million uh, in this country. The good news is we don't exactly know the number, um, and uh, that's because in the United States of America, they can't send you out a survey to the house, unlike other places in the world where they can send you a survey and tell you to check you know, what religious affiliation you belong to. You can't do that in this country. That's a great thing, but um, that leaves us up for speculation. But the point is, it's a growing uh, community, obviously, um, the fastest growing religion, arguably, in the United States of America. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean there's not Sharia law in the city of Dearborn, right? So I live in the city of Dearborn. ML, uh, organization I'm now running, is based in the city of Dearborn. The you know closed doors meetings that we've had very often with folks, like where there's no cameras, nobody's recording anything, where people get to really ask the most uncomfortable questions, right? So the number one one I say is kind of a joke, but it's kind of true. Like, do you have hair, right? People ask that, and that's okay <laughs> to ask that. Aside from that, when we get to those, like, really, like, you know, do you guys, do you guys, we know you fast, and we know Ramadan is coming up, but um, do you actually stop eating for 30 days? You've heard this, like, it's not 30-day continuous, right? It's like 30-day daily fast. And I'm being kind of facetious, I guess. What I'm saying is, amidst all the brilliant work of historians and intellectuals and thinkers, um, chipping away at uh, foreign policy issues and the issues that have come to light from the executive ban. The real core issue, at least in my capacity as a civil rights director and people like Hannah and other kind of activists, is this misunder fundamental misunderstanding of Islam and Muslims. It's just a fundamental one. I mean, the, the ability, I teach a course on Islamic law, for instance, Islamic legal issues and Sharia law at Wayne State Law School. I taught it last semester. And what we spent the whole 12 years, you've taught uh, Phyllis, like imagine spending the first half of the semester undoing everything you've learned about us on the topic. So, you know, this week, what we're gonna do class is not build on, you know, what I think you know before. We're going to undo what I know you've heard too many times on media and television. And that's kind of a subtle point, and it may seem almost like a basic one, but it's very important that our understanding of whole communities of faiths called Muslims in this country is so lopsided uh, at best, if not you know, downright kind of perverted and misunderstood altogether. Um, in terms of this manufacturing of fear and the powers that be, and uh, Phyllis suggested folks chipping away at 
um, you know, the, some of the theories out there as to why some countries are on the um, ban and some are not. I guess I'll do my own on a domestic level. If you look at the, the manufactured fear as it relates to, to Muslims, it's called an industry. It's a very real industry. It's a very lucrative one. Um, if you can get into it, it's pretty high paying, as I hear. It's a joke, but it's pretty high paying. If you are an Islamophobe, if you make a living writing about you know, the um, ugliness and the evilness about Islam and Muslims, from their organizations to how their women dress to how they believe and engage this thing called the universe, you make a lot of money. And the industry you're in is very lucrative. You know, uh, there's a publication I encourage people to check out. It's called Fear Inc. Whole industry is set out to make the Muslim the boogeyman. And it used to be that it's the Muslim there, you know, on that part of the ocean, and it's over there, and that we don't really understand them and their religion and their language and their culture and the things they eat and the like. But now, it's we don't understand those in our midst, right? The ones a few miles away from here in Dearborn, or the large community of Arab Americans or Muslims in New Jersey. And it's this um, willingness, I think, to be, um, you know, uh, just ignorant to, it's, it's a willful ignorance as it relates to Muslims. And why is that? Because there's no recourse. Because you will not be called out, right? People dance around. I mean, I'm a lawyer, so I'm trained to be specific in everything I say. And I can tell you there are some topics that I'm so cautious to enter because there's a political cost to being sloppy on how you represent things. There's a political cost to saying things um, without accuracy. There is no political cost to shooting arrows at Muslim communities and even the ones in the United States. It's kind of like, you know, the facts are a casualty that happen. If they happen, if they're accurate, that's cool. If it's not, you're good. You kind of just, people pundits throw stuff out there as it relates to Muslim and there's no real recourse. Think about that. You're not going to be in trouble. You won't likely be sued. I mean, you know, there's not going to be throw, aside from folks like you really interested in engaging, you know, truth. Uh, there's not a lot of, of, of political will or, or corporate will to get to the core of, of <clears throat> Muslim communities, what they really believe and who they really are. Not as, uh, I guess, directly related to the Yemen uh, topic, the topic of the Yemen war. But then, so the point of all that was enter the Muslim ban. So it's been like this really bad. I, I describe it as this like bad practical joke that's just not going away. So I remember about two years ago, those of us heard Ben Carson. Do you remember saying what Ben Carson said? He, you know, he was asked the question: what Did he have a problem with the Muslim being in the White House? And he, you know, very sophisticatedly said, "I can see how they would, you know, you guys remember this." He said, "Yeah, I, I don't think a Muslim would be equipped to be in the White House." And I remember thinking, "Man, that's Ben Carson and this guy. Every every kid I've ever known, I bought gifted hands and." You sent them a copy of that. Um, so pretty devastating. So from Ben Carson, those, those of us watching the campaign. And then there's this guy called Donald Trump that we kind of thought would just be this like poor joke of a candidate. And you know how the story plays out. And here we are discussing, you know, the most powerful man in the world within days of uh, becoming president doing this thing called banning, you know, of course he's not calling it a ban, right? He's calling executive order, wrapped in the language of patriotism, and there technically is not the word ban in the executive order, so people like to hang their hat on, but you get what I'm saying. Um, for those of us who watch Islamophobia, this was just part of a really kind of ugly foreshadowing that has come to be very real. Where, where are we headed then, is the question. Um, after the executive order, and where are we headed now after the Court of Appeals, and where are we headed as a country? If I had a crystal ball, I would you know, be in a better position, I think. <laughs> I'd be emotionally better off, to be honest, if I knew where this thing was headed. I can tell you that those of us who are watching it closely think that we need to brace for impact as minority communities, as immigrant communities, as people, allies of those communities, as people who care about the direction we're headed. I think that's just going to be the tip of the iceberg, tragically. I know there are bills being introduced across the country to you know, you guys follow this, I don't have to tell you, this is clearly a, a group that, you know, by virtue of the subject at hand that you've come to watch on a Saturday and a cold day, which yesterday was awesome, by the way, I didn't bring a coat till I was parking, I was like, man, it's cold outside, it's pretty cold. Um, 
I think we're counting on the conscience and commitment. I see it's pretty interesting because like almost nobody in here, I mean by like stereotype, right, is an Arab American or Muslim American or like a Yemeni person. And that is so, it's just been so amazing to me, the conscience of people interested in and concerned about issues like immigrant rights, like Islamophobia, you know, these protests at the rally, the, road, the rally and protests at the airport um, right after the ban came out was an amazing group of solidarity and alliance on, you know, people that are never gonna be impacted directly by this ban, right? Don't even, you know, five generations of like, I was a good old fashioned white Americans that, are, that whose conscience has been so shocked by all of this. And those are the people in addition to like Hanan and those other young activists that are gonna take over and continue to do awesome things. So I just laid out a bunch of stuff, Phyllis, for us to apparently deliberate and talk about. Um, wanted to introduce the big issues of Islamophobia and kind of the curtailment and free reign. You know, it's carte blanche to say things about Muslims and their communities and Dude, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to have gone to school forever and be super smart like her and footnote everything to be an expert on Islam. You could, you know, they let you spend a summer in Dubai vacationing, right? And then you get to come back and be a Middle East expert or an Arabist, I mean, uh, or be able to talk about Sharia law, you know, even though all you did was get like the Cliff Notes version of, of the faith. Think about that. We don't allow that to occur on almost any other subject, even intellectually, right? People laugh, laugh you out of, the academy or the classroom or, or, or everywhere else, but there's something about Muslims and their communities and the faith that they subscribe to that somehow free reign that you can kind of be, you know, a novice at and you can jump in the ring and have uh, all the arrows at your arsenal to shoot at them. So just want people to keep that in mind and I'm happy to talk further. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also want to uh... <laughs> mentioned that we are in the city of Hamtramck, which is the only Muslim majority city in America. This is 60 or 65 percent Muslim. We're in the Yemeni community in Hamtramck. This is, and Hamtramck is the poorest city in Michigan. And Yemen is the poorest country in the Middle East, and uh, we have a lot of Bangladeshis, which is from the poorest country in Asia. So this is a very poor country economically, but the city economically, but we're very rich with tremendous culture here, and we're so thrilled that, like you said, we're very fortunate to have Muslims and Yemenis here to uh, experience and work with. So this is the Yemen community. So when you leave here, there's two great restaurants across the street, the Shiva restaurant, the, the uh, uh, Yemen cafe, and on the wall of the Shiva restaurant is a giant mural which celebrates the, the Yemen culture and history that was produced by our organization, One Hand Tramic, and I hope you can support our work. So what we're going to do now is have a 15, 20 minute conversation between the two of them, our special guests, and then we're going to open a Q&A up to the audience. And uh, when we do that, we're going to ask you to sort of line up over here and then come up and grab the mic, So, because we only have one mic, and we want to make sure that we can hear. So we're going to take this event. So once again, a nice round of applause for our two guests, uh, Philip and us. We're going to give them the mic, they can pass it back and forth and ask each other questions. And, and I have one question first to start out. Why do you think there were only certain countries selected for the so-called Muslim ban and others weren't? You know, I, I don't have an exact answer for that. Um, you know, it said that the, the seven countries selected, I guess in, in fairness to Mr. Trump, because, you know, Lawyers always try to argue, arguendo that the seven countries, in fact, were those designated before him uh, under the Obama uh, administration with certain uh, proclivities, if you will, i.e., you know, statistics that you can play around with. So I think, uh, as I understand it, the, those seven countries were kind of used as a fair game starting point. And it's very important to note that these were, by all intents and purposes, a starting point for the ban, right? This wasn't meant to be a be all or end all. Their directive and the messaging was such that uh, fair game were going to be several other countries. This was definitely a floor, not a ceiling, in terms of um, numbers, at least. You know, I think that's a very important point that this was the starting point and not the end point. It's also important to remember that of those seven countries, the U.S. is bombing five, sanctioning one, and has troops stationed and military bases in the seven. So these are all countries that are already under attack by the United States. So this was, in a sense, 
an escalation of existing pressures, right? This wasn't, there was nothing arbitrary about it. Whether or not there's any connection to the economic interests that I spoke of earlier, we don't know. But we do know the facts. We do know where there are no investments to be threatened. And crucially, we do know where the US is already at war. So this has to be seen. I have a, a button on that says war makes refugees that I got when I was speaking in Albany a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> it's something that when we look at the intersection of these two questions, the questions of the Muslim ban and the question of the US wars in the Middle East, they are not two questions, they are one question. Because we have been going to war, we've been going to war against terrorism for more than 15 years. And terrorism is doing just fine. Terrorism is thriving. What's not thriving are the people and the cities and the countries in these countries where we are going to war. So in this context, the link between going to war, making conditions so unbearable that you find, in the case of Syria, half the population of the country is now displaced from their homes. Of those, half are refugees over the border and half are internally displaced. <coughs> When conditions are like that, and then we refuse to allow them to enter the United States, what does that say about our claim to be a country of immigrants? We are really a country of war making. <coughs> yeah, just to follow up, I mean, you know, the, the bomb them and then ban them kind of slow, well, we've heard, and that's exactly true. We'll bomb them and ban them, ban them and, the, and that's what we're doing. And with Syria, obviously, with everybody knowing that it's the one country um, who's refugee, the country who we've indefinitely, so this is, it wasn't like a temporary reevaluate, let's get prudent and re-strategize. This was a indefinite ban on all refugees coming from Syria. So that relative to what Phyllis said, about 50%, one out of every two of them being a refugee, you know, says it all. And there's one other aspect of this that I think is important that was in the, the Muslim ban included another point, which was beyond the Muslim ban, it was the refugee ban. The Trump administration announced in its Muslim ban, which you're right, it didn't call it that, but we know from the conversations with Rudy Giuliani that Donald Trump did intend it to be a Muslim ban. He called it that and asked his friend Giuliani to give him a legal basis for doing a Muslim ban. That was part of the reason that the courts overturned it. But we also know that in the context of this ban, they also cut in half the number, the total number of refugees to be allowed into this country from anywhere in the world. We are facing a moment when there are more refugees and more internally displaced people than since World War II. 65 million people are now displaced around the world. 25 million refugees, 40 million internally displaced, and the U.S. uses that as the basis to say, we're not going to allow in the paltry 110,000 that the Obama administration had said, we're only going to allow in 50. And of those 50, 39 are already here, so we're actually only going to allow in, what is it, another 11,000 11, people. And they brag about this, how generous we are, how our statue says, give me your tired, your poor, as long as they're white and have a really good job already lined up. You know, there's a joke going around, there's a picture that says that France called, they want their statue back. <laughs> and just on the stats that she gave in terms of the appearance of generosity, um, even in terms of the refugees, if you look at it, and I have a friend who's got this crazy political aspiration, so every time I say this, she's like, what if you're wrong? The vetting process for refugees already is so rigorous. I mean, it is, you know, if you sneeze the wrong way up, the officer's not letting you in, you know, you're getting, you're getting booted. It's, it's pretty intense. Now, my friend who's, you know, very smart and savvy says, don't ever say that because, you know, what if we are, what if we are wrong? We have yet to see, thank the heavens, obviously, a terrorist attack ever on our soil by a refugee. And somebody, check out what Fareed Zechariah did a couple weeks ago. It was pretty, pretty creative. Um, he did, looked at the numbers. You have more of a likelihood of being, like you have a, I think it's 0.0001% chance of being impacted 
by conduct of a refugee ever uh, than, than, you know, compared to obviously all the ugliness, just driving, you know, getting in your car and getting on the road somewhere. I mean, this is to put, put it and highlight it in perspective. And, and like perhaps my friend who's cautious and political is all, you know, do we want to take that chance? Well, I mean, we take chances all the time, number one. And number two, as, as Phyllis said, I mean, we're, we're the, the suggestion you know, that we're so generous on these issues is just inaccurate on the numbers, on the straight numbers. The correlation between the increase of refugees and war all across the world and the downward, you know, numbers associated with that also tells it all. So it's, you know, a question of numbers as well, I think. I think that's absolutely right. But let me pose a bit of good news here. This isn't all, I mean, it is all gloom and doom for refugee communities, for people in Yemen or Syria, Palestinians and elsewhere, but there is some good news. One of the pieces of good news is that despite all of the propaganda that we and this country has been subjected to, the Islamophobia, the racism, the xenophobia, all of this, all of the claims that these so-called refugees are really just trying to get into our country to either take advantage of us or to blow us up, you know, that's kind of, that we don't talk about how extreme the vetting is. Despite all that, we are seeing an extraordinary level of human sympathy for refugees and immigrants, particularly refugees in this period. I can't say that it's empathy. I don't think people in this country get it, and I don't think they necessarily try very hard to understand what drives somebody, how bad does it have to be to drive somebody out of their country to seek refuge across such dangers as what Syrian refugees are going through, to put their children through that, to move to a country where they don't speak the language, where they know no one, where they have nothing. How bad does it have to be? Despite all of that, we are seeing extraordinary levels of human sympathy. When the pictures emerged of little Alan Kurdi, the little four-year-old boy who was killed in the crossing to lead the island of Lesbos, the Greek island, that one picture somehow captured the attention in a way that a host of people like me and others saying blah, 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 numbers, 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 doesn't work. Somehow that worked. We need to figure out how to take advantage of that. And I think that the way we're seeing to do that is by recognizing that we're not gonna have any victories for a while in the federal level. We're not gonna be seeing victories in my pestilential town of Washington. We are going to see victories in cities and counties and maybe a few states where city council members are talking about being sanctuary cities and they need to start talking as they are now in Chicago and in a couple of other places to start talking about not only being sanctuary cities but cities that are against the wars that create refugees. People start to get that. You know, you remember last summer, uh, last summer, yeah, the, the Summer Olympics. There was team refugee that played. There were 10 members of this refugee team. They were from Sudan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, one other country I'm forgetting. And they were extraordinary. They were amazing, heroic stories of these young people and what they had gone through to, to keep up their sport and still compete at, at the Olympic level. It was moving and powerful. It made you weep reading it. But at the same time, what did that say about how we're normalizing the wars that create these refugees? That what, now refugees are gonna have a seat at the UN on the Security Council? Because 65 million, that's a pretty big country, actually. So that gives us a, a wedge. It gives us a way in to start talking about how do we change even how we do foreign policy in our city councils. Maybe Hamtrana can be a great example Cities for refuge and peace. We want refugees to come here, but we're gonna fight against the wars that make it necessary for them to come here. It could be a great model for the rest of us. We have a question over here. Yeah, I'd just be happy with, uh, I'm fine with beginning it after. I just wanna say one thing about what Phyllis is saying with the um, silver lining to the extent that what we cover and what we do and what we read. And I, I, this, uh, a friend of a friend the other day was telling me, she hasn't turned on the TV in two weeks. She just said, I can't do it. 
she wants to decompress. It's all just just sadness, or you know, obviously, literally in terms of watching the world, but also the dismay, the dismay and demoralizing. You know, this band thing has brought in the ugliness and visceral of everybody. And um, the good news, I, I think, there she's exactly right. There are two pockets. There are one that are dumbing down on. You know, these, position, these positions and the willingness to be exclusionary and bigoted and, and ugly. And they're dumbing down and they think there's some momentum going. And, and Trump and folks in the administration have given a lot of momentum. But I think the other pocket is like a whoa awakening. Folks that have never been engaged for whatever reason, good reasons and bad, and just apathy or complacency or busyness. Sometimes we're just busy and just, you know, they are. Sleeves rolled up. I mean, I see it. Red, tell me what to do, right? Sign me up, folks, in a way that, you know, to the extent that we could compare, but I guess just impacted from a personal story right after 9 11. I know as a college student, and 9 11, right? You know, September 12th, we just talk about turning point forever in the psyche and consciousness of who we were, where we were headed. There's something, an equally kind of special time special, like, you know, good and bad, but the good part is that people want to know what the heck is going on, they're willing to be informed, they're scratching below the surface, want to be engaged, want to figure stuff out, or taking nothing for granted in terms of what they're being spoon-fed. So, yes, dumbing down, ugliness, bigotry, exclusion, absurdity with where we're headed, but with the absurdity, I think there's a, a promising moment, and it's popping up everywhere. Before we open up to questions, one minute, I just want to ask you one more question and then we'll go into Q&A. Um, we have two very intelligent activist women here who, I don't know how well you knew each other before, but uh, we have a Jewish and a Palestinian activist and they're committed for the same struggle. But I want to know, what bonds you two together other than being activists and uh, progressives? That's a hard one. I love working with brilliant young women. I gotta say, sorry all you men, but it's, it's such a thrill when I see somebody who has come up through our educational system and emerged like you. I mean, it's, it's, it's a gift, it's a gift. And um, I think that people who make the kinds of links that we're talking about between issues of civil rights and racism at home and foreign policy and wars abroad, uh, who have an understanding of internationalism, that's not easy in this country. You don't just get that in school. You know, you have to fight for it. And that's what I love working with. I guess I would say it is a hard question. Um, I'm younger than Phyllis, um, and the only way I can do what I do, or Hanan does what she does, is really like, you know, on the shoulders of giants that did it decades before. It's that simple. Uh, paved the way, did it, set it at a time where it wasn't, you know, we have what I call a lot of born again now, right? The born again, the converts to social justice. And we love that. Uh, come, but people like Phyllis and those before did this stuff day in and day out, said stuff that was uncomfortable in a language that nobody even understood, right? A language of context and history and synthesis. It's very hard to do. And she did it, and only because of the work like she and others can, do we really have the luxury to assess and understand from hindsight. So that's definitely my link to people <laughs> like Phyllis. Um, and I think on the issue of Israel-Palestine, right, one of those wedge issues across the country that it has been since my time as a student, right? And, yeah, in Ann Arbor, the topic of Israel-Palestine was one of those things you could cut with a knife on campus at differing points. Um, just, I guess, as a Palestinian, as a, as a Muslim, um, as a person willing to call fairness fairness and injustice injustice, the uh, Jewish brothers and sisters willing to be at the forefront of the cause of Palestine for Palestinians, for Muslims, against and self-critical to uh, their own, if you will, and continue to lead the way and all uh, fight against racism are just so many. So it's us together that I think can make a difference. Now, let me just say one other quick thing about those who have gone before. 
I've had the honor over the last few years of working occasionally with Harry Belafonte, who's one of the greats. Uh, he's on the board of my institute, so we get to. It's, it's a gift. It's a, it's a privilege. Um, and a few days after the election, when I was just sunk in the depths of despair, Harry called me sort of out of the blue and said, so I hear you're not feeling so good. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know. And I said, Harry, you've been fighting for 75 years. He's going to be 90 day after tomorrow. So, you know, this, he's, he's like way older than me, thankfully. Somebody is. And he's, I said, how are you not devastated? How are you not afraid that everything you've been fighting for for 75 years is at risk? And there was a pause, and then he said, let me tell you something. I was pretty upset for a couple of days, too. But now, I'm excited. I think this is going to be an amazing time. I think we're going to have more unity than we've had in a generation or more. And he started to tell me the story of how the AFL-CIO came together. And I didn't know much of that labor history. I knew a little bit, but I didn't really know how it all happened. The CIO was communist run. It had enormous numbers of African American workers within the unions in the CIO. The AFL, the AFL was overwhelmingly almost entirely white. It was racist, and the Klan had a presence in it, kind of semi official. And he said, You know, nobody thought they could manage to deal with what that would mean. And he said, But over a two year period, he went through this whole long history, which I won't go through, but over a period of two years, they managed to deal with the Klan, get rid of their influence in the AFL-CIO, in the AFL. They managed to join the two institutions and created the AFL-CIO, which for 30 years or more was the most powerful, strongest labor movement the U.S. had ever seen. It was an amazing thing when people never thought they'd be able to pull it off. And he said, I think that's the moment that we're in right now. So. Until they drove off the communists. Um, they were there. At the beginning, that was good. So we're very fortunate to have two amazing speakers with us today. Thank you once again. Let's give both a round of applause. Hi, I'm Karen Hammer. I don't have a question. Uh, clearly, uh, education is key. And um, in our community, that's one of the things we've been trying to do is raise these issues to be discussed and confront them. And Ferndale seems to be doing that too. Ferndale Friends, which is a publication, uh, publicized a huge article on immigrants and refugees and vetting. And it goes into all those particulars. So for anybody who's interested, check it out. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Greg Robinson. I'm a resident of this area. I live right one block over from the Detroit side on Cashmere, right by Hamtramck. Um, I was eating at the Aladdin's restaurant, the restaurant over on the Coney, and I saw the flyer uh, pertaining to this event. And I said, I'm going to attend because my sister was a human rights activist. Or she's a Muslim. Uh, she passed away back in November. Her name was uh, Kaleem Hassan. She was a poet and you know, very active in the community. And I said, I'm going to attend this in her honor. And I'm so glad I did because I see in both of you a reflection of her. So much that you spoke on, uh, she taught us a long time ago. And my family, uh, we are Christians and Muslims. Uh, you know, I started off Christian. Back in the 60s, with the Nation of Islam and all that, we, my family came to Islam. We branched out into all different branches of Islam. We got Sunni, Shiite, so-called Orthodox, Nation of Islam. My family is for the world. And then I married a Christian woman, and so, <laughs> you know, yeah. But anyway, um, I appreciate what you said. How do you pronounce your name? Fatima. 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 Yeah. I appreciate what you said about the um, doctors uh, being Muslim and people not aware. Because that's one of my talking points of all the time of people trying to explain this uh, Islamophobia thing because I said, you know, when we came, with most of us young Americans, black and white, when we came up in school, we had all this opportunity in so many areas. You know, we took sports. We did everything, art, we did everything. But 
people, the immigrants were the ones who did the sciences and the hard maths and uh, uh, became doctors, going into medicine and all those things. Because we were lazy. That's just the truth. We were lazy. We didn't want to take that hard stuff. And so now, when I try to explain that, I say, um, when I was around 14 years old, is when I first started really recognizing the fact that there were Middle Easterners in the community because they had the party stores and whatnot. And I tell people, with, and I lived near Des Moines at the time, over near Chastity High School, and I tell people, in all those years, with all the stores and the gas stations and the mosques and all these things, I never knew any conflicts where people strapped a bomb to themselves. I never knew any conflicts that were so much culturally based. Some of them were culturally based in, you know, somebody come in and steal something in the store, or someone uh, don't like the way the, um, the merchant talked back to them. You had some conflicts like that. But in terms of these political conflicts that, you know, led towards societies, the different cultural societies in the area having these massive conflicts, they have not resisted. And so I try to tell people that what you said, I try to say your, your engineers, your doctors, all these people in all these hard, incredible fields, if they wanted to do something to you, they don't have to strap a bomb to you. And that's all I need to say. Hello, uh, my name is Susan Sunshine, and I'm known as the Earth Poet. And uh, I do have a question, kind of, that I just want to. Uh, I was born in Detroit, I've been a lot of places in the United States, but my friend, in, uh, when we were working on the incinerator, gave me the name Earth Poet. And I'm really glad because that's all the issues I basically work on. Um, I'm going to be 75 in June, and I guess of, uh, of the Agent Orange, I heard that, on, I love that, that's a good one for Trump, he's uh, the Agent of Agent Orange of all the things that are bad. So it really breaks my heart, uh, you know, that they're going to destroy the Earth even more. Uh, but my, kind of my question is, I, know, well, I went to Lansing for the Women's March, and all the speakers, I wasn't speaking that day, but black, brown, and white. I said, what about red? What about yellow? You know, I'm a rainbow person, too, at rainbow gatherings. But, uh, you know, everybody, if you're the Earth poet, because my, you know, the Earth, Mother Earth is my only really boss, because I can't belong to too many organizations. I'm in all the good organizations, but none, because I'm very low income and I can't afford to be in So I'm in all of them, but I'm in none of them as far as pain and stuff. But what are we going to do with this crazy <coughs> White House where everything about us is fake, okay? I mean, the thing is, is they're the ones that are telling the lies. And I know the media has been kind of crummy uh, in some ways, but what I don't like, and what can we do about when they, there's little to no reporting, like at Dapple in North Dakota, until it's time to get the people out of there. But you can't keep poisoning the earth and not have better reporting. Because, uh, you know, it's just, uh, what, what is your ideas on that? Thank you so much. Um, the first thing that prompted me to raise my hand was uh, I felt a flare up in my mind at this discussion of I think it's a false concern that one possible refugee unvetted might cause harm. I don't think that is a legitimate rationale whatsoever for why the that we have reduced the amount of refugees we're let, letting in or um, why we have this ban. I think that is an excuse and the convenient one that triggers fear, I don't think has anything to do with the baseline rationale of the powers that be, which in my mind is more to do with economic containment and this this I, this othering that we continue to do and um, this idea that we have to take care of us before we can give you anything as though we had nothing to do with that and as though we were in some way impoverished um, ourselves. So I, I even take issue with um, entertaining the argument and you know saying you're right we, we, you know if you have a large number you may there's always risk associated with to your point and so I don't think we should even 
pretend that we could predict the futures of all people in, in any case. Um, the question that I want to ask is, um, so I have a home in Hamtramck, I have an open bedroom because my roommate moved out, he's allergic to my cat, and I'm thinking, what can I do in my life, um, how could I provide shelter potentially for someone um, or a family or something like that? And I read um, the What is the What, the book of um, sharing the stories of one of the lost boys of Sudan, and it shared how a nonprofit in Atlanta seemed to have been a hub of refugees from that crisis um, that was somewhat separate from the federal programs, and, and I was encouraged by that, and I don't see that currently now. I just wonder if there's anything like that. What is the model, and, and how can I do something in my own life? So, um, I'm Lisa Sennett. I'm a high school teacher at Hamtramck High School. Um, most of my students are Muslim. And um, when I worked in Southwest Detroit for 20 years as a Detroit public school teacher, when I first started working there, um, there was an open border between U.S. and Mexico. There was a lot of feeling of freedom in the community. And skip forward to today where um, they arrested a DACA student, which is a, um, a Mexican, you know, dreamer who came here real young. So I'm just wondering, other than like being a welcoming presence in my classroom and asking them, like, because I'm a Spanish teacher, to translate ningún ser humano es ilegal as part of their homework, like no human being is illegal. Like so, just and other than being, you know, a welcoming, overtly welcoming presence. What can I tell my students that I will do for them other than be a good teacher? Like, I mean, um, when I was in Southwest Detroit, um, I would like physically put myself between myself and immigration officers when they were trying to arrest family members. But I don't know what else I can say. I feel um, very individual right now. I don't know which team there's, if I open my email box, there's like, 30 people wanting me to send them $3 to like, yeah. fight better. And I'm not really sure where to go with um, my efforts. Hi, I have a question for um, either or both of you. Um, there's an outfit called Middle East Forum. You probably know what it is. It's Daniel Pipes. Um, Organization and they, they they put out various things, but um, they've kind of set themselves up as as uh, trying to be kind of advisors to the current administration. Uh, one of the things they put out a number of articles saying now is the time uh, for the United States to um, encourage Israel to inflict a complete defeat on the Palestinians so that there won't be uh, so that that problem will just go away, but. One of the things I saw the other day is a piece where um, calling for the White House to create a commission of investigation of Islam, um, which they say they should have subpoena powers and all this kind of thing, um, to investigate um, Islam and mosques and Muslims in the United States. Now, in that form, that would be you know entirely unconstitutional, although that may not be a problem for the current administration, but I'm wondering if you've seen anything about this and um, how seriously you think um, we should take it. So I'll just start the, the last question uh, Dave asked about um, these commissions. So there are also bills being introduced along the lines to um, designate as a FTO, a foreign terrorist organization, the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. Now the problem, uh, the, the issue surrounding that designation, and we know that who comes on or off the FTO, just you know, procedurally, it's a, it's a matter of politics, because it changes, depending on who the executive in power is to designate. But, um, and this is why at some point, um, other organizations that are now on there haven't been, hadn't been, and, and it's a rot it's basically kind of rotating, for lack of a better word. So if, if I know Muslim communities are watching this designation of the Muslim Brotherhood very closely, and why is that? 
first off, a loose designation of the Muslim Brotherhood is, um, would, could potentially, particularly when you couple it with the motive to go into mosques, the motive to attack Muslim American civil rights groups or Muslim student associations, which would impact students across the country. When you, when you have that looming and then you have the FTO designation of the Muslim Brotherhood, the problem with that is it's not clear what Muslim Brotherhood they're talking about. Are they talking about some armed folks sitting somewhere in Cairo? Well, you know, nobody would have a problem with that designation. If you're talking about the aspects of founders of the Muslim Brotherhood that are 100 years old now that may have influenced a way in which you fast or you pray, and the residual then is that leadership opened up a mosque in Southeast Detroit, then are they still Muslim Brotherhood in such a way that they would be linked to the FTO designation? Well, if somebody deems that to be the case, then that would be the arm with which uh, people poking around would then be able to poke around in that mosque in Southeast Detroit. You see the link, it's kind of amorphous, and if it's by design amorphous, then it's a nice entryway into like protected space, right? There's something about a mosque or a place of worship, or there's something about our gathering here that's public, but there's something special in American about our like expectation of you know, not being shut down because we're tangentially linked to some FTO that's tangentially linked to a political group that's tangentially linked to some guy 100 years ago. Do you see the problem with that? So to answer the last question um, that Dave asked about a commission on Islam by Islamophobes like Daniel Pipes is that it seems far-fetched, but nothing surprised us yet, right? And so, you know, brace for impact is kind of what I said before. No, they're not. No, they're not. Um, I was going to say something about two of the questions, one about Islamophobia and the other about what do we do. But I just wanted to mention one other point about the politicization of the so-called terrorism designation. We should just always remember and always remind people that President Nelson Mandela was on the U.S. terrorism list until 1988. Keep that in mind. Uh, on Islamophobia, I think... There's a couple of historical things we have to keep in mind. Islamophobia, like other kinds of racism and discrimination, has been around a long time. It has a long and ignoble history in this country. But it only became a really big deal when it was tied to particular political events, the first one of which was the Iranian Revolution in 1979. Some of you, again, are old enough to remember that time, you not, where the t-shirts that had a head and then a a um, target superimposed on the face was the face of Ayatollah Khomeini. Remember that? Oh, yeah. That was the real rise of the current wave of Islamophobia. Then you had another whole wave of it around the time of the first Gulf War in 1990-91, the Gulf crisis, Iraq invades Kuwait, and suddenly the US says, we cannot let this occupation stand, the key word being this, because other occupations, as we know, Iraq was hardly the first Middle Eastern country to invade and occupy a neighbor. But this one we could not allow to stand, and the war res results from that. Islamophobia played a huge role in mobilizing people across this country to support a war against a known dictator who had long been an ally of the US, that being Saddam Hussein. Then we have 9-11 and a whole new level of Islamophobia that's linked not just to building up hatred against the people who carried out this horrific crime against humanity, but to justify war as the response. You know, you, you mentioned earlier about how the real change in the world was not September 11, it was September 12, the day that Bush announced that the response to this crime would be to take the world to war. Islamophobia becomes a huge tool in the arsenal of what it's gonna take to convince people in this country that somehow war is an appropriate response. So the issue of Islamophobia, just like racism has a fundamental economic origin, slavery had an economic origin, Islamophobia has economic and political and military origins, and it's used for those purposes. The other question on what do we do, this is of course the fundamental question, 
I think there's a lot of organizations that are just emerging now, those that are, that are, that are popping up, that are not just the ones that are you know, online every day telling you to send three dollars, I'm getting you know, 30 of them a day too, it's like, really you people, three dollars, that's what you're looking for here. And I mean, these are wonderful organizations. I don't, I mean, many of them are doing incredible work and there is a theory that says if you ask people for three dollars, they're likely to send you five or 10. And so you do that. It sounds like nothing when they ask for three and you send five because three seems so chintzy and you know. So it works, so you know, do that if you can. But that's not the whole answer. The whole answer has much more to do with what do we do in our communities. So right now, the new orders that came out last week of how ICE and the CPB, the, the enforcement operations of the immigration services in this country, how they should be deciding who is vulnerable to being picked up, which is essentially anybody. Communities themselves are rising to figure out how do we make real the commitment to be a sanctuary city, a sanctuary church, a sanctuary mosque, a sanctuary restaurant, a sanctuary campus. None of these exist in law. Sorry, all you lawyers. There's no such thing as a sanctuary city in law. What there is, is the ability and the willingness. This is all about political will. So it means people mobilizing at the local level to convince your city council, your county board of supervisors, maybe even the state assembly or the state senate, let alone the mayor, the county, whatever the county official is called, and the governor, to say, we can't stop ICE from arresting people here, but we can stop our police, our sheriffs, all of our law enforcement personnel from cooperating with them. We can say that we will not provide information when somebody is arrested who we think might be undocumented. We will not ask that person and we will not send their name to ICE, that we will not cooperate. They can do that. There's no one national organization that's taking on the coordination of all this. I've been looking because we've been trying to figure out how to get to that group to, with the goal of linking it to the question of stopping the wars that create the refugees. Turns out there's not. There's a lot of great groups. There's a group called Freedom Cities that's mainly in and around New York, but also has one group in Chicago and one in Phoenix and one in Portland and one in LA that are trying to link protection of the African American community from police violence with protection of refugees and immigrants. So that's one. There's the Sanctuary Cities grouping, which is a lot faith-based, but there's also now Sanctuary Restaurants being coordinated by Rock, the restaurant, organizing, restaurant Workers Organizing Center based out of Washington. So there's a lot of these, but all of them are based on groups in local places like Ham, Ham Trap. Yeah. yeah, that place. <laughs> where you guys start calling people in your city council and saying, we need to go beyond being a sanctuary city. Here's a model resolution. I can give you language if you want to do this. You could be a great model. We're going to be a city that protects our residents of whatever immigration status they may have. We will provide protection. The city of Chicago just allocated a million dollars to pay for legal representation for any resident of Chicago facing deportation because of uh, being undocumented. That's huge, because that's money. That's real money. So isn't that a better use of our tax money than sending it off to the Israeli military or to go to war in Yemen? You know, this is what, I have a couple of statistics here for Detroit, but it's close. Just for the Pentagon slush fund, which is about $68 billion, that's about 10% of the full Pentagon budget, of that, Detroit taxpayers this year are paying $26 million of Detroit residents' tax money to pay for those wars. If you didn't pay that money, here's a few other things you could do. You could hire 300 elementary school teachers for a year. You could provide 470 infrastructure jobs. You could put 2,950 kids in Head Start for a year. You could have 1,124 students getting Pell Grants of almost $6,000 for four years. Imagine what keeps us safer. Jobs and education and healthcare, or going to war across the world and refusing refugees. So that's what we start with. You start here. 
You start with your own city council, your own mayor, and say, it's not enough for us to say we are a multiracial, multicultural city, we are a Muslim majority city. That's great. That just means it should be easier to do the work that has to be done, which is here. It might include what they're calling uh, sanctuary streets, which means forming a, uh, a network either by phone or by text, where when a raid happens at a factory or at a restaurant, the word goes out and instantly people come and they surround the buses. Civil disobedience, people that are prepared to be arrested. That means not asking people who are themselves vulnerable who are themselves immigrants, who are themselves in any particular position of vulnerability. Other people who are more privileged take the risk of getting arrested in order to prevent people from being taken. That's what our work is in solidarity really means. If I got arrested walking out of here, I'd have a hard time documenting that I was legal. I don't think I have anything that proves I'm legal. I don't think I've got anything on me that proves I'm legal if I were arrested outside. And I don't know if you do either. You look white and I look white. That's not at all funny. That's exactly the basis of it. That's what gets picked up. It's not me. It's not you. I would like to hear two things discussed quickly. One of them is, what is the role? Who are the Yemeni people in the United States? And why are they here and how did they get here? Was it in relationship to the current war? And what role do the Yemeni community in the United States play vis-a-vis -vis the war? That's the first question. And the second question is, there are three Yemeni grocery stores within half a block, maybe more, and a mosque and two restaurants. Now, I would like to hear some comments from you and perhaps the organizing committee about what you feel about the presence of Yemenis in this meeting right now, the lack thereof, or maybe you feel it's a good turnout. I don't really know. Um, well, I guess I, I don't know the history of Yemen. I have Hanan as an organizer who who's, could, is smarter than I can say. So let's let Hanan talk. And a round of applause for Hanan. She's the coolest organizer ever. <laughs> Uh, so the first question about uh, the history of Yemeni immigration to the United States. Um, I can tell you a little bit more about my personal family story, and that is um, my father was one of the first uh, in the Yemeni wave to come to the U.S. in the early 70s, so this is not a recent thing. Um, he used to work on cargo ships, um, uh, and a lot of other Yemenis did as well. And he didn't bring us over until 97 when... Um, our circumstances in Yemen, you know, got worse, and he was able to get us visas to come over here. Um, and it's it's really difficult to talk about. And I don't know the entire history, and I can't um, I can't speak to that. But uh, there have been different waves, you know, based on different circumstances. But I know from the 70s to the 90s, there was just natural immigration, you know. Um, and I was a naturalized citizen through my father. Um, that's just how it played out. But recently, we can see that there are a lot more immigrants because of the recent issue in Yemen. Um, and because people are just hurrying up their um, immigration applications because of the situation. So when it happened, people were very quick to follow up on their family applications to move to the US and so on. So we find that there's a lot more immigration now. Um, and that was just a very brief commentary on that. But my, the, according to, your, to answer your second question about um, about their presence in this room, and that's a very good point. Um, um, Idris is also Yemeni. Uh, Hana is also Yemeni. Is there anyone else that's Yemeni that I didn't forget? I'm Yemeni. Um, and there's there another gentleman. Who? Yemeni's here in spirit. They're being updated. Awesome. She's updating them. <laughs> uh, and then there was another older gentleman. He had mentioned that uh, there was another event meeting through a Yemeni organization that was held at the same time, uh, and so. That is one answer. So it's just another, con you know, conflicting event. Um, the second ans answer to that would be just um, maybe lack of Arabic language provided at this event that maybe would have deterred somebody from attending. Um, and then the third reason is what Bill and I had talked about at the beginning of the event, and that is people are fearful to come to an event like this um, to post something on Facebook that they're here about policy issues that relate to the U.S. government. Um, and so it's, it's really difficult. And, and 
the younger folks here are, I guess, more outgoing in, in the sense that they're active about this work. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it's just a very difficult thing to um, attend and, and listen. And although they are very interested, and a lot of people on Facebook, when I invited them and, and talked to them, they, they were excited because there's not a lot of conversation happening about Yemen and, and the Muslim ban with respect to Yemen. So um, that's, that's all I have. Thank you for that, Hanan. That's, it is really useful. I think it is very important that we recognize the cultural appropriation, in a sense, that we are engaged in here. I think that the other thing we should just keep in mind is that Yemenis and Yemeni Americans know a lot more about this, certainly than I do, probably more than you do, and I think that we should be respecting that and looking to how we can seek out going to meetings, going to events, calling on people in the Yemeni community for us to go, that's what being in solidarity means. We have a, a problem in the peace movement, I think, in the past. We have always asked people from other communities, other movements, to come to us. We're doing a protest, we're doing an event, we're doing a teach-in, you should come. And people do or they don't, based on whatever reasons. But we don't often enough say, what are you doing in your community? Can we come? Can we come and learn about your struggle? Can we come and figure out how we might work together on something in the future? But it's too often expecting other people to come to us. And I think this is a great model of, we've come to a community where I hope people will go to those restaurants for coffee afterwards and you know hang out but, and learn about this amazing community center. But it's also not just about our movement either. And, and something kind of just kind of subtle, like obvious, but you know, if we're here talking about the impact on folks, uh, the impact on people impacted by the ban, well, they know about it. I mean, not to sound like duh, I mean, you know, sometimes we're, we, like she said, cultural appropriation, we're talking about communities that already, they don't need to hear from me or Phyllis or quite frankly anybody in here because they live the impact. They're very, firm. I mean, it goes through their veins and it's, you know, a household conversation. So I think um, there's that component to just kind of bear in mind. And then the other thing is, I know, just to bring it back to kind of some of the work I do with the American Muslim and Minority Advocacy League, one of our missions is to talk about Islamophobia and uh, racism against Muslim communities, which would include Yemen Yemenis. And we actually have, you know, indirectly in our mandate to, to have a certain number of events that actually are completely outside of the Arab American or Muslim American community. So I mean there's something to be said about talking about communities that are impacted without any of those communities by design being the target audience in question. I mean that's kind of how we get out of our silos. So I think it's actually, I look at the fact that it's kind of successful you know, no disrespect to anybody, but that they are members of the non-Yemeni, non, you know, people not directly impacted by the seven-member uh, band, the seven-country band. So, and if you do want to connect with some Yemeni community people, send us an email. I'll be sure Hanan is involved with Emel and directly with the Yemeni community. It's Emel, just the plug, and I think it's appropriate. A M A L, A M A L at amalusa.org. So that's ML, ML at mlusa.org. Any questions about Islamophobia in general, how I could be a resource, how Hanan can be a resource, and about any, you know, the overall topics we covered. So it's not a bad thing to see all of our allies. Hi, um, I'm Idris Mutar. Um, and I actually just wanted to jump back up here because uh, the the person who asked the question asked about something that I was already going to touch on, which is involvement in the community. Um, I consider myself more of a transit advocate, uh, and one thing I noticed last fall with the Regional Transit Authority is that um, two, whenever one, whenever I went to meetings, it was it looked similar to what it looks like here. Uh, older people tend to be involved, and there's an issue with reaching out to younger people. Um, and then the other thing was that Macomb County was influential in the outcome of the election. So, so two things that I wanted to touch on and I think we need to work on more is reaching out to younger people and getting younger people in our own community more involved. I think the, you know, you asked a, a valid, there was a valid criticism that you know, the room isn't necessarily full of 
yummy people from Community Ball, so you guys touched on some good things with that. Um, and the other thing, how do we reach out to people on the other end of the political spectrum? Um, you know, the Trump voters who are potentially misguided or, you know, need more, kind of, need to be swayed in the, the, the correct direction. Maybe they're misinformed. So. Reach out to the older people, too. We got to get around. Okay. <laughs> we need more yes. Let's hear it for the older people. <laughs>